Hello again, everyone. This is Michael Zupan from Bite Size Impressions, and I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about my experience revisiting The Witcher 3. Um, I expect this might become a little bit of a video series that I do. Um, you know, going back and playing old games and talking about them as I revisit them, or just going back and maybe just reviewing old games. I've done that formally in the past with uh, Super Mario 64 on this channel. It went by real well. I'm really proud of the work that I did there. So here we go. I wanted to talk about this game because it's been out for just a little over a year at this point. I picked it up on the PS4 last year immediately upon release, and I probably sunk about 40 to 45 hours into that game. Of course, being that I play so many games and I try and get my hands on just about everything that comes out, unless for whatever reason it really doesn't interest me, um, I moved on to other games with the intent of basically just taking a break from The Witcher, that I would uh, you know, eventually go back to that game, and I never did because... Uh, once I started playing through other stuff, it was just game after game after game, and I never was able to escape that barrage of game releases until about now. Uh, it's the summertime, things are slow, I've already wrapped up Uncharted 4, Doom, and Dark Souls 3, and I'm playing some Overwatch, um, but I figured as far as single-player campaign stuff is concerned, The Witcher 3 was a perfect fit. So I picked up the game on the PC earlier this year, because I got a new computer which can actually run this game at pretty much 60 frames per second on almost all ultra settings. And it's been almost like playing an entirely different game. Uh, but I'm not really here to talk about technical performance or anything like that. I decided to pick up this game now because uh, CD Projekt Red, the development team behind this game, have finished releasing all of the DLC for this game. Now if you're not aware, um, yes, they have released some of that stuff that we usually tend to frown upon um, when we're talking about DLC and microtransactions. They have did, done zero in the way of microtransactions, but they have released cosmetic DLC. But instead of charging you for that stuff like everybody else in this in industry seems to do nowadays, they gave that all to you for free. They gave that to you for free. The stuff that they charged you for was a $25 season pass. Um, which was, I believe, a $5 savings if you uh, decided to pick up that season pass for both expansions uh, expansions that they were going to be releasing. And they released both of them at this point. One of them was about a 15-hour expansion. A legit expansion. New story, new single-player stuff for you to play. And the one that they just released recently was Blood and Wine, which is at least 25 hours from what I'm hearing. Uh, anybody who has not played this game yet, you really should be on the lookout for this game and pick it up along with the season pass. You can get it now for less than what the full retail game without all that DLC costs at the time of its release. You know, here in the United States, retail games go for $60. Um, but now you can routinely find this game for $25 and then $25 for the season pass. You're probably talking at least 150 hours worth of content for you to actually barrel your way through, if not more. Uh, so if you're really one of those gamers that needs to buy something that you know is going to uh, engage you and hold your interest for a very long time and be a great value proposition uh, for quality for your dollar, this is the game. Uh, speaking about this game, if you're not really aware, you play as The Witcher, Geralt of Rivia. And there's a lot of stuff going on in this game. The story is basically you're in this world. It's a fantasy world, of course. There's, there's uh, you know, monsters and ghouls and, uh, you know, things of that nature, as well as, you know, human beings who are, who are just shitty in general that you're going to fight along the way, bandits and other, you know, assorted random assholes and... Uh, uh, you know, uh, beasts such as bears and things of that nature, you're going to come across them in the wild too, and dragons. But this this story takes place in a world where the world at ma of man, sort of like Game of Thrones, is at war with itself. And unfortunately, what this means is each side is looking very carefully at the things that are going on, and they know there's a lot of people who have access to magic, and neither side wants the other to have witches or anybody who's affiliated with, you know, wizardry or any sort of witchcraft. They don't want them to go to one side and sort of become a weapon. You know what I mean? So, you are you know, you walk through some of these cities and you hear tales or even see, you know, bonfires, uh, witches and whatnot being burned at the stake, sort of Salem witch trial sort of stuff going on. Um, 
So yeah, it's it, there's a lot of stuff going on in this world, but of course for Witcher, he's more interested in Ciri, his daughter, who's being chased down by the Wild Hunt, which is a much greater threat than anyone realizes, and they're really creepy looking. They have this sort of um, helmet that they wear that looks like a skull, and they're garbed in black armor and everything, so he's after her. Um, throughout the course of the story, he has two love interests that sort of... Uh, it, it comes into play. He basically has to decide what he's going to do. And the, the wonderful thing about these games is that they really leave you to decide what you want to do. Um, are you going to say, hmm, maybe I don't really want to engage with either one of them. Should I engage with both of them? Or how about this one or that one? Of course, every choice that you make in this game will change things as you progress throughout the rest of the story. And it's not just the love triangle, it's also about many other choices that you make throughout the campaign, too. There's uh, a few different endings that you can actually make for this game, and it's all based on choices that you make. Um, most of the time you should know what the choices are that you're making, but sometimes you won't. It's part of the mystery of The Witcher. One of the things that this game does really, really well is a sense of culture. You could be wandering through a swamp, and you can find maybe four cabins, just four small cabins built out in the middle of nowhere, but you'll see people trying to survive. You'll see somebody doing their clothes outside, washing their clothes. You'll see other people doing manual labor, chopping wood and whatnot. You might see a merchant standing nearby hoping to make a little bit of money. You might see a couple of kids playing out there. You get a real sense for what a community like that is. But there's also other towns that are a little bit larger and other ones a little bit larger even still. And then, of course, you have a full-blown... A city or two or more. I'm not completely through the game, so I can't say how many exactly there are, but when you move into these places, you can definitely tell that, you know, the traffic picks up and that, you know, the economy in these places seems to be more hustle and bustle. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. There's a really good sense of the economy and culture in this game. Another thing that this game does particularly well is uh, the interaction between Geralt and everyone that he comes across. And it doesn't matter if it's a main quest NPC that you're talking about or someone off to the side. Maybe it's even only someone that you talk to just one time. That's all it takes. You're going to walk away with a sense of knowing who that person was, um, sort of how their mind works. You're going to feel like they're sort of a person. And that's what CD Projekt Red have really done so well with this game, is that they've made this feel like a living, breathing world. But of course, that might not be enough for a gamer if you really want to focus on the gameplay. Fortunately, um, as you're seeing through the footage, you have uh, you know free reign to basically go wherever you want. Uh, you're going to run across monsters and bad guys and everything, and then you're going to engage in battle with one of two swords. You have a steel sword, which is used ma mainly for your wildlife beasts and also uh, you know, bandits or other humans that you come across that you need to fight against. And then you have a silver sword, which is for other nasties, such as you know the, the, the ghouls and goblins that you're going to come across. And... The difficult, you know, there's a bit of difficulty to the combat, especially in the earlier part of the game. But as you level up throughout the game, you know, you're going to sort of overpower things. And for me, that's really great. That's what I want. I want my leveling up in a game to actually feel like it meant something. And it does in this game. For anyone else who does want a challenge with the latest patching with this game, now that the new DLC is out, they have added this thing so that you can actually choose to have enemies scale with you throughout the campaign. So that's going to add a lot of replay value for a lot of gamers too. Uh, the missions, the side quests, primary or otherwise, you're going to get a lot of variety. You're going to get a lot of interaction with characters. Um, this game really has everything and it keeps changing things up along the way so that nothing gets stale and makes you feel like you're doing the same sort of fetch quest over and over and over again. This isn't, I love Ubisoft and I think their games are a lot of fun, but you know, they have that, that repetition thing that's sort of holding them back in a lot of their games. The Witcher 3 does not have that. So I would say revisiting this game with the improvements that they've made to their menu system, which used to be. It started out fairly bad. It was sort of a mess. They tried fixing it a couple of months after release, and now uh, they've changed it yet again, and now it's a really a breeze to go through your entire inventory, make sure that you've uh, seen everything that you have and read everything that you, you've missed. And 
I'm more enthralled in this game as a result of the little tweaks and changes they've made throughout the entirety of its campaign this time around than I was even last year. Uh, CD Projekt Red, you know, I said before, they've done this game right with DLC and um, not doing microtransactions and only selling people the real meaty stuff, actual uh, campaign expansions. And they've also supported this game, you know, technically. They've been updating this game and listening to fan feedback for the last year. And, like, they, you know, this, the fact that they're still releasing meaningful patches for this game is wonderful. So um, that's my experience revisiting this game. I'm still having a wonderful time with it. And I'm actually thinking I'm going to see it through to the end this time because I've got all summer to do it, goddammit. So thank you very much for watching. And, uh... Listening to my thoughts on revisiting Witcher 3. Hopefully, if you haven't played this game, this sort of nudges you in the right direction. If not, if this doesn't look like your sort of thing, because there is a little bit of open world uh, gameplay footage that's rolling here. Um, you know, everybody's got different tastes, and, uh, you know, that's part of the fun thing about being a gamer. We can have, you know, conversations about st stuff like this, and to each their own. So, uh, hopefully, I've informed you a little bit of what to expect and what you can see in this game. Have a good one, everybody.